good morning, everybody. First off, I want to start by saying thank you for being here. I realize this is uh, the morning after the DevRox party, so you're all probably feeling that. I'm seeing some extra coffee cups out there. Uh, but not only that, these are perhaps not the two most popular topics for a developer conference, being we're talking about testing and security. So I appreciate the, you being here. I'm sure plenty of other people will come in, but know that you were here first. Um, also, let me know if I go too fast. I did uh, an Ignite one here last night in the same room. I don't know if you saw that. So I now associate this room with 15 second slides and yelling a lot. So tell me to calm down if you, if you want to actually digest something a little longer than, than five minutes. But so we'll be talking about, like I said, uh, testing and security and uh, assertions in that realm and how we want to increase the quality of said elements. So kind of a quick overview. This is your TLDR version. Uh, we'll kind of go over the learning of test fundamentals and how we learn as people and how, we get and how that's evolved in the developer process and testing. Some simple opportunities that we have today to kind of increase our, our learning strategy and quality. And then how to uh, install this security tool to do that. So hopefully you have some practical takeaways that we will address. Okay, but first, who am I? Why am I standing up here? I used this slide last night and didn't talk about it, so if you were here, then great. Um, I'm currently employed at Human IT, a consultant company in southern Sweden. I'm uh, on contract to Access Communications. They probably do a lot of the security cameras, probably here in the UK is uh, very fond of those. So doing uh, software testing and security and a lot of back-end stuff right now. But you know, more, we are all more than just the one thing we are doing at this moment, though obviously that's, that's important as well. But there's a whole history behind it. And so, and I want to talk about this because we're going to be talking about security, which is generally a field that is seen as impossible to get into or extremely mysterious or, well, we also, uh, you know, you have to be able to do Hollywood level hacks at all times in order to be considered a part of security. So I want to highlight my non-technical background saying that if you make sandwiches for five years, you are also qualified to get into security. You probably shouldn't be the head of security yet, but that's, that's okay. So some of these things about me, like I said, I, I built sandwiches for five years. I worked for a few years as a autopsy technician at a coroner's office. I have a degree in physiology and psychology, so I was uh, helping uh, ascertain cause of death for uh, Boulder County in Colorado in the U.S. I worked at, uh, at a library for a few years. I've installed Windows doing construction. So, th no, this is not the OS, like literally installing Windows. <laughs> um, I had one of these Nokia brick phones until like 2013. Uh, so that's how late I am to this tech game. Uh, I got a text message from the service provider AT&T saying, we're discontinuing the entire network you're on. You should probably switch phones. That's how, how late I was. And uh, I also have several, actually, more certificates in cars than technical ones. So I've got a brake uh, rehabilitation certificate, uh, engine rebuild and repair. Um, I've built engines in cars before, not, not the M3, but that similar model. Whereas my, my technical ones are a little, little more loose. Okay, but that's me. Oh, actually, so I want to take this opportunity to ask about all of you here today. So who here is a tester? Are there... Ooh, okay, <laughs> cool. <laughs> Great. Um, who here is a software developer? I see... Oh, not too many today. Okay. And security? Oh, great. A project manager, product owner... Scrum Master. <laughs> okay, cool. No, that's great. I love to see a yeah, uh, diverse crowd, and I like to see who's, uh, who's you know, really interested in kind of the perspective you're bringing to it, because I want to meet you halfway so we can, we, can, we can all come out with something good with that. So with that in mind, uh, you know, we're all here to learn. We're all at a conference to try and grab as much knowledge and cram it into our brain and then tape our brain shut so it doesn't fall out. 
um, and we're using this here because we're trying to, you know, why do we learn? We're trying to increase the quality of our output. We're trying to increase our, ourselves. We're trying to be better at what we do. We're trying to make the world better around us. Um, I don't know if you know who this is. This is Patrick Baboumian. He's an uh, Iranian immigrant to Germany who's the strongest man in Germany uh, when it comes to a couple, a couple classes. I'm not sure if the concrete keg is one. But he's also vegan. And the reason that's important is because he's not only trying to improve himself, but he's also acknowledging his impact on the world around him. And he's trying to increase the quality of both. And that's really what we're trying to do when we do things like testing, when we do security, and we do things like learning at conferences. So how do we do learning? I'm going to step into the psychology role here for a second. Um, we all do learning all the time, but we might not, not always know exactly how or how we learn about learning. It might not be, you don't have to think about learning to learn. But so I want to just highlight that a little bit, that we use a very, there's a very simple cycle that humans go through where we have an idea, and at the top, you know, we put that into practice uh, in reality, and reality gives us some kind of feedback. Either the idea works and improves things, or it makes things worse, and there's our feedback, you know, we're happy or we're sad, and that feeds back to the idea, and then we adjust the idea. This is the loop you go through when you're developing. Uh, you get an idea, you make some code, you run it, it doesn't work, you're sad, and you get a new idea. Maybe I should check on what best practices are. Maybe I should see if someone else has done it. Stack Overflow. And you go through this little thing until you get the happy face. And then you push it to a tester like me, and I do a, a similar thing. But this is called uh, operant conditioning. It's where the feedback you receive... Um, directly impacts how you learn the thing that you are doing. And that's what we're going to try and do today. So, to pursue test quality, uh, from a testing perspective, we have to turn everything that developers make into assertions. Basically, we try and break things down into yes or no statements. If this is an input, we expect this as an output. Does it match? Yes or no. When it, whether it's unit tests, you know, integration tests, you establish some kind of definition or baseline, and you measure that in a yes or no way, and that's an assertion. And so that's how we're pursuing quality. And then when it's a no, then we give it back to the developer saying, you know, hey, this and this happened, this was the result, you know, how can we work together to fix this? Uh, same with security, really. But we'll get into that. But that's actually something you all know, even though there's only a few testers here. This is something you do all the time without realizing it. So let's say you're going to the grocery store to buy an avocado, because everyone loves, loves avocado, right? You're going there, and you think, oh, well, that's obvious. Everyone just, you just go there and buy an avocado. But if you actually think about how you're determining that, how do you know it's an avocado? And you're like, oh, well, it's, it's, it looks like one. Well, that's, that requirement isn't good enough. You have to break that down into yes or no assertions. You think, you know, oh, is it green? Is it round? Is it lumpy? Is it located in the produce section? Is it in the avocado sec subsection of the produce section? There's a bunch of different yes or no questions you're asking yourself unconsciously when it comes to buying this avocado. Because if you went with just the requirements of, oh, buy a round, lumpy thing, you might buy that basketball, which I tell you does not taste as good as an avocado. Or you might buy Lumpy Space Princess, who's all round, also round and lumpy. But so this, this is the world of assertions that I live in, is trying to take these, buy an avocado, and turn that into 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, yes or no questions. And these are things you all do. When you go out to your car, you, know, you don't consciously ask yourself, but on some level your, your brain is processing this. Is this my car? Does this look like my car? Does my key work with this one? Are the tires not flat? These are all things you're doing before you drive away. Am I drunk? Hopefully not, etc. So how do we learn new stuff? Because at some point you didn't know what an avocado was. You're probably, you know, probably as a kid, you might have called it, you know, a, a pineapple. And you know, that's funny for us as adults, but as a kid, you know, that's a genuine question at one point in our lives. So how do you learn new stuff? And usually uh, one effective easy way is with analogy or relating something you do already know to something you don't. So a tree is something that we understand. Uh, we've been around them more or less all our lives. You kind of, you know why there's leaves at the top, you know why there's roots at the bottom, even if you're not a treeologist. 
so that's, that's something you understand. You know, the nutrients go up and down, and, you know, there's water and sunlight and all that, carbon dioxide, oxygen. But then what if you want to understand the, the bronchial airway system in lungs? That's, not, that's something we all have, but that's not something you actually interact with unless you're in a profession where you do. But one place to start understanding this is looking at the tree, both visually, but also functionally, that there's, there's a resource distribution taking place that's very similar in both. That's an, an analogy we can make. So we want to take the known, pair it to some kind of unknown in order to make the unknown something we're comfortable interacting with and learning. And that's what we're going to try and do today. Oh, I prompted my own slide. So we, we're going to try and take security today and testing and try and pair that to stuff we are already doing on a daily basis and use that as the foundation for, for learning these things and hopefully applying them uh, off into the future in a quality way. So what we are going to do, practically speaking, and if you do have laptops, you can try and follow along. If not, that's fine. We want to use open source security tools. So Firefox uh, or your browser of choice. And then this is OWASP Zap. Who has heard of OWASP Zap? OK. OK, so and who's heard of OWASP just in general? Oh, more than more? OK, great. That's an excellent starting place for that. Uh, I just wanted to touch on it uh, in the case that you hadn't, but it's, um, like it says, they're Open Web Application Security Project, but it's a huge uh, nonprofit group where they're trying to make um, security information accessible and standards available. And they do uh, a whole lot of work all over the place, both in process and technical. Ways uh, there's a lot of cheat sheets and references and all kinds of things online. Just OWASP.org, you can find anything on secure coding and testing processes and frameworks, uh, test playgrounds, programs, applications, uh, great forums. We'll get into some more references. Uh, but the big um, one you may have heard of is the top 10, where they try and release annually a kind of breakdown of the 10 most prevalent. Uh, and, and impactful like uh, security issues uh, in the community. And they don't always release it annually because sometimes the top 10 don't change, i.e. people aren't fixing them. So, so that's their background. OK, so we want to uh, go out on a limb here and do a bit of a demo, but uh, back to that tree analogy. So we want to take something we know and something we don't know. So we're taking this security tool, oh, that's a PowerPoint, all right. Uh, huh. Oh, not that one, nope. Oh, all right. Okay, so, so I mentioned using OWASP Zap, and that's what this is right here. Uh, it's free, yeah, download it, use it, uh, there's great support for it. So what we want to do is, here's our browser, here's Firefox. So how many people use a web browser at work? Okay, that was a dumb question. But uh, the main reason is, uh, so you're always using a browser, browser whether, even if you're not a front-end developer, I'm sure you're online, you're looking up things, you can take this browser, and you can point it to something like a Wasp Zap, which is uh, an intercepting proxy. Is that something people are familiar with using like Fiddler or, okay, a few. Um, but how many use like DevTools network tab? Uh, okay, or some variation thereof. Okay, so similar to that, but basically what, uh, what OWASP Zap will do is it will take, you know, and I'll do that first. OK, yeah, so we'll come back to that. Uh, basically, Zap will sit in between your browser and the internet. And much like that network tab, it's going to uh, collect a list of resources being called by your browser. And it's just going to collect them, and it's going to run some passive scanners. But that's basically it. So you can actually hook this up to your browser and just browse as, as normally, doing whatever you want to do. You want to go like uh, Stack Overflow. Uh, uh, email, music. I don't know what this marshmallow thing is. Is, that a, is, that, is this a trending thing I'm behind on? All of my suggestions from YouTube are turned off, so apparently that's the new trending thing. Okay, 
Um, so these are, this is your, your normal browsing uh, at work or at home or whatever it is. You can see that you know, Zap has collected, oh, look, look how many, yeah, look how many Googles I made. Zap has collected you know, all the traffic we just made. And you don't have to do anything else. You browse as normal and let this collect all your traffic. Now, how does this connect back to the tree thing? So the reason I recommend this is that passive scanner I mentioned. And you know, as it's, as it's uh, collecting your traffic, forwarding it to the internet, it's running a, a set of passive rules on the, both the requests and the responses. And it's looking for evidence or indication that something may not have been implemented in a secure way, or that there may be an issue in something that was, that was created. And so here we're doing something familiar. You're Googling or using your search engine of choice. And here is your door into the world of security, which is unfamiliar. Network traffic, you kind of understand that, you know, working with APIs and all kinds of stuff, bouncing back and forth, uh, HTTP, etc. But the real trick here is this alerts tab. And that's the result of those passive scanners. And here, here are some things where, you know, maybe we see some terms that we're not sure what that means. We did our, our normal, uh, normal browsing, so that we understand. But you know what? And absence of anti C surf tokens or reverse tab nabbing. You know, like what? What on earth is that? And so this becomes our our educational point. This is our. This is comparing the lungs to the tree. This is like, oh, okay. You know, this tab is flagging this for some reason, but I don't know why. So you can go in here and you can read it. Wow, if I scroll around here. Here we go. It's weird when it's zoomed, but... Uh, and just read it. That's it. You're not a security tester yet, or you're not a chief of security, but this is where you can start to become familiar with the terminology and what it's looking for and why. You can see uh, at the top there, there's a PII scanner. We'll get a little bit more into that, but that's uh, extremely important when it comes to uh, compliance and privacy things. I haven't, uh, most likely these are false positives, but, oh yeah, Google, that's fine. But this is that doorway where you can start, you can just start learning about these things. And really, once you start learning, that's where you know how to ask better questions and how to look for even better answers and start looking for people who have those answers and can relate to something you're doing. So this is that, this is that first step, this is the first toe in the pond of what security is. And I would say, as far as this sort of passive um, this sort of passive scanning goes, having it attached to a browser, just do that for six months. Have the tool attached to your browser, read about these things, and don't even do anything else. That's basically what I did uh, with my first job. Oh boy, okay, we want to go back out. Okay. So where are we in the slides? We shouldn't have done that. Okay. I broke my slides. Okay, well that's fine. <laughs> who needs who needs those? Let's do the mini versions. Hmm. So we may have discovered a, a new a new trick where the demo works, but then the slides don't. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> no, we don't. Okay, so we showed this a little bit. That's great. So that's what's going on there. I've got the I've got the the alerts on the bottom left. We've got the traffic on the right. And and if you're curious about you know how I set it up, I had it set up beforehand. But you can modify your browser just to direct all traffic to to a single program with its proxy settings. You've probably had to do that for work for low, uh, corporate proxies and stuff like that. It's the same thing. But if there's you know more detailed questions, we can address that at the end, or I'd be happy to answer it personally as well. So that's, that's your doorway into the world to become, becoming educated and knowing what the questions are and knowing what the, the terms are because the first step into a world is just knowing what people are talking about and why. And then you can start to think about becoming part of the conversation. So step two, how can we use it in existing tests? So that was just kind of for browsing, you know, not actually integrating it in your workflow yet, but can we use it in existing tests? Which is a simple answer, which is yes. 
just like you can have a, a browser point to this tool running those passive scanners. You can have your SOAP UI, you can have your Selenium, Postman, anything that has HTTP requests of any kind can just go through this tool and do the tests that you normally do, you know, the normal assertions you're making on response times or status codes or regexes or however you want to do it, uh, even full functional flows, and it will be scanning those for its pre-programmed security issues, which you can learn about and you know, follow along on, uh, without making any major changes. So this is the short part, and this is the easy part. We like that. All right, down arrow doesn't work now. Okay, so here's what I think is the cool, fun part, well, one of the many cool, fun parts, which is can I do tests inside Zap? Like, if you really want to streamline your process, you might not want to have a test suite running two or three other items going through Zap into the test application, you know, like a stack of four, different, four or five different items. Try and minimize that if you can. Keep things more maintainable and efficient. Can we do them in Zap? And thanks to some fantastic scripting that they've implemented, trying to make it uh, more friendly to developers and the general users, not, uh, not necessarily the security community specifically, yes, you can. So you'll see on the left, let's zoom in a little bit. I opened up this scripts tab. And basically what they've done is they've implemented a script language inside the tool itself. And it's actually, uh, it, it'll take Python, it'll take JavaScript, uh, but there's also a graphical one, which I'll show you here because that's easier to look at, uh, all of which work. And so we've got, oh, let's see, maybe it's not zoom in on that one. So I've created a little, a little demo script there. And basically what that will do is it can take API calls or requests made to websites or services of any kind, and you can program them in there and rerun them anytime you want, which is the same way you run tests. But then you're like, okay, well, how do we make assertions on it? And they've created fancy ways of having your, your little if-then statements where you can say what you're expecting versus what you're not expecting, and you can make those results show up in that alerts tab when they fail. So let's run that one here. Ah, right. Okay. Uh, let's do that. So these are all the requests that I just made by pushing that play button on the script. And we can see uh, the network traffic, great. That's what we expected to see. And we can see right here, I had previously set up an assertion up and down here that we were expecting a 200 status code, but we got a 404, and so that, that flagged an alert. So what does that look like? Uh, we made that informational, so we can scroll down here. And it shows up in my little alerts tab. And you can pre-program that. So let's see, where did that come from? That one. So here's the script. There's all the requests we saw just made. We'll get into some cool handling there in a second. Uh, it uses loops. So all those uh, 30 requests at the end were all, were all uh, conducted via loop. And here's my, here's my assertion. I'm expecting a 200. If I don't get a 200, then it'll create an alert in our little tab down there. Seems pretty, pretty exciting, right? Now you'll notice also that all the requests I made, they, had, they were full URLs, whereas here in the test, I've actually uh, denoted them as variables and IDs. And this is actually what makes this possible uh, as actual uh, test framework, is the fact that you can create variables uh, such as I've done here, we've set, we've set this. Uh, what that does is it makes the first GET request, and then it'll assign an ID to a particular regex in the response to that request, and then it'll use that variable everywhere else I reference it in this script. And here you can just declare another variable just as a string. You can do numbers, you can do loops, you can do anything like that. And 
So while that's not revolutionary uh, at all from a test perspective, all the test frameworks can do this, the fact is that this one is doing it with the extra advantage that we have a huge community creating passive scan rules that are also looking for security issues at the same time. So I can run my normal functional tests like 200s, 500s, regexes for response bodies, uh, headers, etc., while someone else is doing all the hard work or is leveraging these extra, these extra security assertions. And I think we're coming up on why that is good. That was my backup demo. Oh, OK. So you know what? Let's do this part. OK, who likes documenting? You are awesome. <laughs> but your team loves you also because they, they probably hate it. So. I hate knowledge silos. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Smash those knowledge silos. <laughs> right, so it's not, it's not always a fun thing. Side note, even if you forget everything I talk about here, uh, one fun thing that we've started using at my team that uh, works surprisingly well is uh, instead of taking an innovation day every month or two months or however your team might like to do that sort of thing, is create a documentation day. And while it, it sounds like a nightmare to most people, most developers will be like, oh, I'm sick that day. Uh, by, by creating a space where no one's allowed to think or do anything else, it ends up being kind of fun where you're trying to look through, back through all your documentation, trying to find loopholes. It's like Sherlock Holmes. You're like, oh, wow, this is really old. Oh, you know, how do we update this? Um, I recommend doing that. Uh, it's worked really well for us. Okay, back to the equally exciting Excel sheet. Um, so, speaking of documentation, as a tester, and especially if you have a, you know, a big process or a big team and a lot of like, compliance ne uh, necessary elements, you want to have documented you know, your test cases, your use cases, what you're testing for and why, and it's kind of a pain to update, update and maintain, but it's uh, unfortunate, uh, just a part of the job, and it's called a job, it's not called a fun. Sucks, but oh well. So uh, I believe I modeled this off the test I just showed you. So this is uh, an example of what I would document. Uh, so we've got you know a user story, a rough story at the top. We've got like a login. We get a firmware list. We access like an application endpoint, or we try to. And you know we've got a few assertions there. You know we're asserting which status codes. It looks like in this case we shouldn't be able to access that application endpoint. Uh, we should be able to download these files and, you know, the API docs. So there's, I'm saying, this is just my document saying, you know, I'm asserting status codes, checking response body lengths, checking response time on a few of those endpoints, and, you know, how many regexes am I leveraging on the response body? So that would be, you know, what is that? A total of, uh, for this entire test case, this is probably like 40 or 50 assertions. And then, you know, this is in a continuous integration pipeline. This runs every time, you know, we build or deploy, whatever. So that as a tester, that's pretty normal because, you, you know, more assertions are better, but they need to be quality assertions, and you have to balance, you know, how many different things you're, you can look at with the amount of time you have. So this is, you know, 40 or 50 total. That's, you know, that's pretty good, depending, you know, what functions, uh, you know, we're looking at. But what I want to uh, emphasize here is... Off to the right, what we're going to see is I've also documented all the additional assertions made by Zap in the passive scanners that I didn't have to do anything for, that I get to just reap the, the benefits of, that it's also looking for. So we're looking for these, looking for some of that. Oop. Oh, I'm not going to be able to scroll all the way over there with this zoomed out. Okay, that's fine. So Zap is looking for some of those things and some of these, a bunch of that, a bunch of those over there. Ah, you know how long that would take me to write all those? I don't know, I, too, too much. But do all of them apply to these cases? Probably not. But again, because I didn't have to do any, any work to get those in place, that's pretty awesome. So let's look at uh, a few of these just to give you an example of something that you wouldn't normally think of and that the average tester isn't going to create an assertion for, usually because it's not going to be in a requirement, it's not going to be in a user story. 
it's, it's not always the sort of thing a product owner is going to think of ahead of time. So let's see, what, uh, I mean, cache control headers, that's uh, Heartbleed, that's uh, Cookie, Secure Flag, where was the, okay, here's, here we go. So up here we have Base64 Disclosure. Now why would that be an issue? Everyone uses Base64 all the time, right? Um, so that's not something I would ever write an assertion to check for. But Zap is checking for that for the reason that historically, hopefully not the case anymore, but historically, there were times where Base64 was used to take sensitive data and make it look like it didn't mean anything. Take a password, oh, Base64, oh, no, no one knows what it is. You can't tell what that is. That's secure now. That's, that's encrypted. That's hashed. And it's like, no, that's just base64 encoded. You can just, you can reverse that anytime you want. And so this is looking for that for the sake of finding bad programming practices. Now that's not something, uh, an assertion I would ever build into everything, but the fact that this is checking for that and will flag it is awesome because I didn't have to do that. And then when I see base64, I'll be like, oh, okay, you know, what is that? Oh, okay, that's just a, a timestamp. Oh, it doesn't matter. But if somewhere down the line, if I'm working on an API where we do have maybe a junior developer that's got, that's like, oh, let's put this credit card number in base64, this will find it. And that's not a, uh, an assertion I would normally have made on my own. So that's, that's one good case. There's, you know, error, uh, oh, crap. <laughs> um. Excessive comments, that's, uh, uh, here's another huge one. And this is also kind of an oversimplification. Each one of these assertions it's making is actually probably about 100 or more uh, if-else statements. Uh, but here another one, it lists as an uh, insecure component. And that's something that uh, like our nice folks outside at Sneak will look at, where they're looking at libraries and stuff for existing vulnerabilities. But that's not something you know I have time to know or build into all of my tests assertion-wise. You know, I'd have to maintain a database or integrate with something else, like Sneak, actually. But this will flag that automatically. Be like, oh, you know, this is running Apache, you know, 1.2. Like, do you sure you want to do that? That's got known vulnerabilities for it. And that's not something I, as a tester, will normally make an assertion for. That's not something a product owner will make requirements for. Oh, make sure we don't use this one Apache version. So this is checking for, for us just by virtue of it being included in the traffic stream, which I think is cool, which is why I'm up here talking about it. Okay. That's my... But what else it does? Okay. So obviously your next question is, well, if it does all that stuff, but if that's it, you know, we don't, we don't work in that manual way all the time or even, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, it has great uh, support uh, with Docker. There's uh, exposed APIs to control the application itself. Uh, which are RESTful, I believe, and also like there's a Python one, so you can control it programmatically. Uh, we've got ours at work running through Jenkins, so it can do that. I don't necessarily recommend the, uh, the plugin. There is a plugin for it, uh, but it's not very well maintained and it's more focused on active scans. Um, Zap is working on kind of a heads up display where it integrates into the browser itself for all you front end folks where you can actually do your testing in the browser, so a lot more like a Selenium IDE, and that's going to be coming out a lot more. Uh, so what? Okay, there's my backup for the other slide. Okay, cool. So what do we got? 17 minutes. Oh, I don't know why that's there. Uh, right. So, and speaking of those passive rules, so those are the ones up here on the left. Um, oh, that was uh, the other good example, is the, uh, the PII alert that we saw, the private, uh, personally identifiable information. And that's a big one. You know, the Base64 thing I was saying that it was checking for, that's a little bit of an old problem, hopefully, but PII is a, a big new one. And uh, especially if you're working near marketing or whatnot, there's a lot of information that they want to be collecting about users, you know, where your users are, and they might not be aware of best technical practice for that. 
So you might end up with departments saying, oh, you know, we need, a, we need a unique user ID for everyone who accesses our website. You know, let's use their phone number. Let's use their IP address. Hopefully not. Let's use their credit card. And this, this scanner is checking for that. It's got, you know, when you, download, or you, when you activate those passive scanners, it's got, you know, this find credit cards JS. And it's got just a big pile of regexes looking for credit cards. And you can tell it's working because a lot of timestamps It'll, f it'll calculate that there's like a valid Visa card number in your timestamp. And you're like, oh, credit card number. Oh, crap, that can't be in there. Oh, no, it's just a timestamp. But it's good to know it's working. So these are things that, you know, we don't, I don't have time to code 20 RecXs looking for credit cards or uh, social security numbers or personal numbers. But this is checking that already. Oops, scrolling around. Okay, so what... Oh, let's make this small again. Okay, so maybe a bit of... So you've seen kind of some test script after I made it, but maybe that's, that's a little confusing because I already I, you know, pre-prepared that. So if you're looking at this tool, we kind of understand what this is. This is collecting all our network traffic. You know, how do you turn that into that test on the, uh, on the left there that we are using? And you just grab whichever network request you want. And you go down to add to Zest script. And now it's in our test. And so any you could run your entire like functional suite and it'll collect all the tab or all the requests. You can grab all of them, just right click, put them in a test, and then you click that run button and it'll go through that same suite every time. And then and on the left, that's where you're going to be doing the. If you want to add, uh, if you want to add conditions, if you want to add variables, if you want to add actions, you can have test scripts call other scripts. So you can have nested uh, test processes, and they can be an if-then-else statements. Here, are loops. We all love loops. That's fun. Okay, so that's. The long way of saying, yes, you can run your tests in Zap. That was all just one question. Okay, so other fun things as a tester. Okay, this history is long and annoying me now. So let's get rid of that. And I don't want those. Let's do our one API. Great. Okay. So this bottom one, that's the request I just made. Just a little get request to a fake API, or a real fake API, whatever. Uh, so one thing, especially as a tester, I'll end up doing is there's a lot of, uh, when a new feature is coming out before it can be turned into an automated thing that you repeat is a lot of manual testing where you're trying to evaluate the boundaries of a function or you know, how it behaves, what it's integrating with other things. And that's you know a natural part of the process. So when it comes to APIs, there's also a right click where you can bring up a little window of that request. And this is what a lot of people, especially uh, in development as well, you'll do in Postman, where you're still trying to see get it to work right the first time. You just grab that request like I did, right click on it, and then here we can just resend it as much as you want. Now this exists. Uh, like in Burp Suite as well as a hacking tool, where normally you're trying to you're trying to massage a particular endpoint to produce an error, or get your code injection to work, and you have to get the syntax just right. But you can use this from a non-security perspective as well, where it's just like, oh, okay, well, let's see if that works. Oh, does it, uh, what about 13? Uh, okay, that's good. Uh, you know, what if uh, what about what about 135? It's like, okay, that's good too. So you don't have to be doing uh, security stuff with this. this. This is excellent for debugging and kind of the, your, your manual aspect of the testing. And you can change all the headers. You can change your request method, hosts, etc. All that fun stuff. And another one is especially if you, where you end up in some data-driven type stuff, which can be a pain in the ass to set up in some cases especially when it comes to testing versions. I think that's what I use it a lot because um, we, we work with a lot of versioned software and you have to 
determine you know, what search results are they returning the things we expect to search for. So again, if we do a right click, okay, here you're in the attack tab, so watch out. But the bottom one, the fuzzer, is normally used from a security perspective to deliver a huge number of payloads to a given endpoint or to replace a certain aspect of a request with, with these malicious payloads. So in this case, I could highlight you know, that, and then I might start trying to do uh, uh, some kind of malicious URL encoded input or trying to access the server behind it, et cetera, et cetera. But you can also use that just from pure test perspective. If I don't want to do, if I need to test like the boundaries from this endpoint on one to a thousand, but I don't want to do this, you know, a thousand times, I could just do uh, the right clicking that I just did, and I'll do numbers. I'll do one to a thousand increment of one. Let's do that, and then you start your fuzzer, and then you can't see it. And it'll just do all those for you. And let's stop that. And then you can browse through and kind of sort these results and look for deviations in the response time or the response code or uh, response body, anything, anything unusual you're looking for. Again, this is kind of the manual stage, but you can get a lot of coverage on, and if you find you know, three or four errors in this, you can right click these, add these to a script to focus on more later. So another cool non-security aspect you can use this tool for. All right, well, here are we at? We have nine minutes left, and I don't want to take up all the time. Perfect. This is actually right where I want to be. Okay, so that was probably a lot. You're, thank you for sticking with it. <laughs> I know you're, you're battling dehydration and all kinds of other things. So I want to open this up right now. Who has... Some questions besides, can I leave? Yes? Is it possible to get SAP to like, test for SQL injections and process scripting, stuff like that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And what it does is because it'll, it'll grab that response body and it's, it's, it's got its own internal rules through those scanners where it's looking for... Um, yeah, script injected script tags and what whatnot like that. That's more the security side where it's got pre-programmed payloads where it will try and deliver and then it will see if it's getting those back. So yes, that's the short answer. Oh, your question was, can it test for cross-site scripting? Sorry, I need to restate it for that. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Other questions, concerns, wonders, bewilderment. Anything's good. Yes. Yeah, suggestions are great too. Great. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. His suggestion was that uh, OWASP also has a vulnerable, intentionally vulnerable web applications that you can download or access where you can practice the security testing aspects against, and it'll also include uh, instructions on how to use Zap, which is excellent, and I will have a reference for that, so thank you. Another question, yes. <laughs> Right, that's definitely, uh, I'm not sure I can, okay, uh, your question is how do you connect Jenkins to Zap? And it's an excellent question, I'm not sure I can sufficiently cover it here. It's its own source of uh, references and whatnot, but uh, generally you just need Zap the, the application on the server or one of these Docker images or whatever. Uh, that Jenkins can access. So uh, in our case, we have it on the same, the same platform, and then Jenkins will have uh, sufficient rights to spin up like a headless version of Zap without the UI and run the automated stuff. But there's plenty of forums uh, online of people who need to do this in a variety of different ways. So yes, it's possible, and it depends. <laughs> okay, well, we'll do some of these real quick. So I wanted to uh, give you some references. Uh, for those of you that like photoing slides, this is probably the best one. 
So at the top we have, that's where you get Zap from. On the second one there, there's the user group, which is where you can ask all your questions, both super smart questions and the ones where you might be embarrassed to ask. Uh, it's for everybody, beginners. Um, the project lead regularly is on there answering questions. The lead developers are usually on there answering questions. I'm always, I'm always on there, so you can say you saw me speak and I'll say hi. Uh, I'm kind of the self-appointed first-line support, trying to help people just set it up and get it running uh, to try and take the heat off the lead developers so they don't have to answer how do I set up a proxy type questions. Uh, there's some other proxies if you don't like this one, which you can get similar results from. Uh, how to's with uh, OZAP, with OWASP and ZAP in general, from programming, testing, all kinds of different things. Uh, testing guides, best practices. And as we did, everyone get this one that got it? I don't see any more phones up. Okay. And as mentioned, there are playgrounds. So there's WebGoat. There's a Juice Shop is the newest OWASP one, and that one, there's even a, a public instance on Heroku app, which you can use anytime you want. Uh, Google Grow Year is a good one. Uh, the next one is Damn Vulnerable Web Application. That's like a FANC banking app. Testfire.net. So now, uh, throughout this talk, I talked about doing testing and using you know, assertions to your advantage and kind of the f taking advantage of the fact that we've got a bunch of passive assertions being made by this tool and that that can be used to both educate yourself and increase your awareness of both what's good practice, what's happening, and kind of what's going on with your application. I didn't really cover any of the actual security testing um, functionality within the tool, except for that fuzzer sort of. So uh, I want to emphasize that there's a lot of cool things in it that you should absolutely play with and learn, but you know, don't go to your actual bank website and say, oh, what does this attack button do? Oh, this is fun. There's all these requests happening. Wow, neat. You, know, you want to have that wow, neat learning moment, but technically these are payloads. These are you know, real live things that can harm systems and that you should not be leveraging any of those uh, against a system that you're not allowed to test. Or that, and a lot of these test ones, they'll have a disclaimer at the bottom that says you can test this, except denial of service, or you know they might have a stipulation. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to play around, but make sure you know how to play safely. And that's why I want to include that. Any last questions? And yes. Right, that is a great question. And with the way I'm running it, uh, your question was, have I been able to make these assertions block a build? And uh, the way I'm running it, not in the build, in like a Jenkins build process, uh, since these are running through kind of network requests, the build has to be done and deployed for these tests to run. So in the... Uh, it's kind of blocking in the sense if you have a stage environment, so it's built to that, and then if it fails, then you know not to build to production. But it won't fail mid-build like a lot of unit tests and stuff like that can. So I'm not aware of any way that's possible with these kinds of tests, but I know some people uh, have some automated uh, security ones where they, they, using the plugins, they can, but the short answer is no. Does that answer your question? Okay, good. But these are all, I mean, these are things, you know, uh, the developers are, they're keen to kind of have the tool adopted and, you know, improve the world. So if, you know, you bring these questions up to those forums and those user groups, they're happy to take input and you'll find ways to make that happen too or to inform the design in the future because it's all open source. Other questions? No. Well, again, thank you. You've been an excellent audience in the toughest slot of the day. <laughs> so...